Cop African Diaspora Forum that we are uh, partnering today and Universal Rights Association. I would like to welcome you to another Euratop program hosted by URA and ADF. First of all, let me introduce the both organizations. Um, that's starting from African Diaspora Forum. Uh, is a non-profit organization open to all willing individuals and organizations sharing the objectives of the forum. Its origin, origin, originally consists in the union of a number of organizations representing African migrant communities living in South Africa. And when we come to Universal Rights Association, URA is a civil society organization uh, dedicated to promote and protect human rights, the rule of law, democracy, peace, and sustainable development. And URA focuses on creating awareness and advice solutions on social problems, injustices, and human rights abuses. As you all know, yesterday was 9 August, uh, today is the 10th, and we celebrate uh, National Women's Day in and I personally would like to celebrate every woman who are uh, part of our online audience now. You are wonderful and we are grateful for the part you play in our lives. Before I start, I would like to remind that as usual, we have audience uh, from different countries now around the world. Uh, and remember that you can ask your questions and make your comment during our program on Zoom chat and on our Facebook page. Uh, and we also uh, put the program on our uh, Universal Rights Association YouTube channel after we finish live program. And about an uh, hour or so uh, for our program and I quickly would like to introduce our panelists today uh, I must say we really have very distinguished panelists today. Uh, I would like to start from uh, Mr. Ella Gandhi, founder of Gandhi Development Trust and granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi. Welcome, ma'am, and thank you for uh, participating. You can unmute yourself if you want to. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and our uh, second panelist today, we have Honorable Fatima Chan, former Deputy Minister for a quite a long time of Department of Home Affairs and member of South African Parliament. Welcome, ma'am, and thank you for participating. Um, uh, and we have, um, sorry, yes. Uh, and we have Dr. Algoni, Chairman of African Diaspora Forum. Uh, welcome, sir, and thank you for participating. And we lastly have Rehana Khan Parker, founder of WOZA, uh, Women in Law, and director of Rehana Khan Parker Associates. Uh, thank you for participating. Um, as you all know, today's topic uh, is gender-based violence from the perspective of human rights. Uh, before I give the floor to our panelists, I just would like to make a short introduction uh, and give some statistics and numbers about the topic. Uh, firstly, let us understand gender-based violence or violence against women and girls. Gender-based violence is violence that is directed to an individual based on gender identity. In it includes physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, and psychological abuse, threats, oppression or pressure, and economic or uh, educational deprivation, whether occurring in public or private uh, life. And according to the uh, United Nations Development Agency, gender-based violence occurs in every country, uh, territory, and region in the world and globally, again, according to UNDP, uh, the globally 35% of women have experienced physical or sexual violence. According to the World Bank, gender-based violence affects one 
in every woman in their lifetime. And unfortunately, globally, as many as 38% of murders of women are committed by an intimate partner. And unfortunately, there is not too many reports and updated data on gender-based violence according to countries. We see some numbers, but we hardly see how the countries are individually doing. But we see um, more clear uh, reports done by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, shortly OECD. And according to the the worst country on violence against women amongst the 37 member countries uh, of OECD. And some of you may uh, know the massive purge taking place in Turkey is, uh, since uh, 2016 and hundreds of thousands of women and girls are getting affected by this uh, horrible purge. But when we go outside of OECD countries, again, according to the OECD report in 2019, situation uh, get worse in certain region in Africa, uh, South Asia, and South America. And I've read several reports uh, during my research for the program and Democratic Republic of Congo comes the worst country along with African, uh, along with Afghanistan, uh, almost in every report, unfortunately. When we come to South Africa, I'll quickly murder rate of women in South Africa was five times more than world rate in 2000 and only dropped to almost 2.5 times more of the world rate by 2015, according to Department of Justice and Statistics South Africa. In bed, but at least there is some improvement. Even before the lockdown, gender-based violence numbers were on rise. And according to, again, Statistics South Africa, uh, reporting that the murder rate for women increased by 117% between 2015, 16, and 17. Uh, the number of women uh, who experienced sexual offenses also increased uh, of 53% in the same period. These statistics belong before lockdown, and we all know that it goes worse uh, with lockdown and the effects of COVID-19. We don't have uh, annual numbers for 2020 yet, but we know that during his address to nation uh, in July, President Cyril Ramaphosa mentioned uh, and, and femicides as another pandemic. And I quote, he said, femicides is ragging in our country alongside COVID-19. And he also mentioned during his address on uh, 12 July, he said 51% of South African women have experienced violence at the hands of someone with whom they are in a relationship. And according to the latest statistics from South African police service, one woman is being murdered in every three hours in South Africa. So now I would like to turn to our panelists. Uh, uh, and I just would like to remind that please make your comments for seven to 10 minutes for the first round. And I'll ask for the second round for your close up minutes. Um, starting from uh, Ms. Fatima Chohan. Ma'am, uh, we hear the statistics and uh, this is the situation in South Africa and around the world. Uh, we are, uh, these numbers, are of direct uh, physical violence number, yet we couldn't go to uh, the other aspects such as verbal, emotional, psychological, and so forth. Um, as a woman who served for a long time as one of the leaders in this country, what should we do to stop gender-based violence? And what are the responsibilities of civil society and stop to this violence? Yes, ma'am, floor is yours. Um, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to, to you, Atil, and uh, to everybody joining us today. Um, I would like to, to answer your question directly, and there are no simple answers to that particular question. 
I think uh, there needs to be a discussion about the human condition. Um, I think very often we talk about gender violence, we talk about uh, disharmony in society as a whole, you've, you've quoted murder rates, etc. cetera. Um, as, a, as, 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 the, as the problem as opposed to a symptom of the problem. I think the human condition, um, and not just in South Africa, but, but across the world now, is in a serious state of disharmony. Um, and by its very nature, the human condition requires and yearns for a state of balance, a state of tranquility, a state of peace. I greeted you with assalamu alaikum earlier. And in the Islamic culture, uh, and maybe I should just translate what that means. It means, may peace be upon you. It is not just a greeting, it's a prayer, it's a blessing. Um, it is what I wish for you. Um, and this is in recognition of what it is that human beings yearn for, the state of tranquility. Um, a state of balance implies a duality. So the relational concept of yin and yang uh, are universally opposing yet complementary energies. Um, and this can be said about the female quality and the male quality in the context of our discussion today. And clearly, if there is um, a mutually uh, balanced male and female quality in society as uh, in nature, uh, you have a sense that society uh, is thriving, that nature is thriving. Um, and clearly where we are today, uh, that, that can't be said to be the case. And one of the, one of the uh, I think, biggest strides we've made in, in this country is just having this opportunity every year to reflect on our relationships, our gender relationships, where, where is it that we're going? How do we stay talk of, stock of where we are? And how do we intend to move uh, into the future? I think one of the, the biggest things society can do is to articulate and not tolerate uh, violence generally, but gender violence in particular. Um, and I think that uh, as, as a very young nation, uh, we have made huge strides in that direction where uh, society has uh, been able to reflect on its intolerance and unacceptability of this phenomenon in our midst. As much as we uh, talk about statistics, I think one of the biggest issues throughout the world is that when it comes to domestic violence, when it comes to violence in the family, these are things that are not articulated. And so it doesn't help uh, to point to statistics as being the reality of the situation. I think experts will tell you that the stats are a mere indicator and don't really reflect uh, the true situation. And that goes for South Africa as it does for, for many, many other countries. Um, so I think that's the first, the first opportunity that we have a civil society to rectify what is wrong. Somebody who is very wise once said to me, you cannot address a problem unless you understand what the cause of that problem is. You have to diagnose it. And 
for me, uh, very often when people speak to this issue, uh, we speak uh, obviously with uh, a huge amount of exasperation because uh, very often we feel that we're not able to address uh, what has gone wrong in society. And I, I uh, take a different view. I do think that the more we speak about it, the more we realize that as women particularly, on the one hand, we are the creators of society. We are the creators of, what, of cultures. We are the creators of human beings. Um, and therefore, we are not necessarily just victims in this scenario. Uh, as, as mothers, uh, we give birth to uh, children, we give birth to sons, and very often uh, it is, they grow up to be men. And we craft their outlook, their relationships with our sex and our gender. Uh, and therefore, we have it in our hands to, uh, to influence in a very, very positive way uh, the outcome and the future of our society insofar as uh, certainly gender harmony is concerned. Um, I always uh, refer to, to Lucretia Mott, who uh, was one of the famous suffragists when she said, the world has never seen a truly great nation because in the degradation of women, uh, the very fountains of life are poisoned at their source. And I think the more we reflect on that issue, uh, the more we understand that this speaks to every society in the history of humankind. Um, and it certainly uh, puts things into perspective. Uh, and for me, uh, it says that we have never really got it right. But there is also hope in what she says, because she says that women are the source of society and they, therein lies a great deal of power. Um, let me just say uh, finally, if, if I may, that uh, when the uh, Women's March happened in 1956, uh, there was a, a clarion call uh, which uh, basically goes as follows. It says, Watinta Bafazi Watinta Bogoto. If you strike a woman, you strike a rock. Uh, this is not a posture of victimhood. It certainly was a galvanization of uh, essentially the feminine power. And for me, I think the more we reflect on the yin and yang in society and understand that as much as uh, society has to bring to the fore the masculine power, the, mas the masculine energy, likewise, a society will never grow, will never thrive without an equal space, uh, a complementing space for the complementing power of the female. And in what we do when we raise our children, in what we do with our relationships with the men in our lives, we teach by our actions. And I think I stop right there. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for, uh, for your points that I will remember uh, of, uh, from uh, you that you said the women are the source of society, which you quote, and uh, you uh, you talk about the quality of life and equity between men and uh, women, which is um, quite true. Uh, thank you for your comments, and I would like to. 
um, Dr. Egoni, as a man and the leader of society, uh, uh, civil society network, how should we stop gender-based violence? What is the responsibility of civil society uh, to, 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 make the, um, to make the people that were part of that society um, commit this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, crimes so, uh, or abuse human rights. So what do you, what do you have to say uh, on this? You need to unmute yourself, Dr. Elgon. Yes, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the, the, the question. Actually, I, I wanted to start by saying, you see, the, the definition itself of gender-based violence uh, has about six items in it. I don't want that we look only at one item of it because now even the digital abuse is becoming a big problem. Uh, uh, physical assault, forced marriage and the mutilation, rape, the economic violence against women is an issue that we need to look at. And the psycho, uh, emotional, but for me, I feel that this is, this is a government responsibility to put the, the policies that the, the, the NGOs can work on with the other uh, uh, agencies on implementing because uh, NGOs alone, the civil society alone cannot do it. And there are a number of challenges actually. I looked at almost about 10 challenges that are that the, the, the civic society are working on to try and, and oil the stick joints in them. One of them is the, the political will of the government and the leadership. Although there is political will, but it is not used to make things happen at ground level. And because the political will is not that strong, the leaders are put help civic society uh, enforce the policies that the government has put on the, on the ground. As we can most of the projects looking at our short-term uh, projects, and usually we wait for international donors or local donors to support them. So they are short-lived and their sustainability is very difficult. And the other thing is the issue of, of the changing priorities within government short resources. Usually issues of gender-based violence are pushed to the back, especially now when we have this COVID-19. Most of the projects that are looking at gender violence are pushed to the back and we need to find resources to push them forward. One of the most difficult ones is the issue of communication between civic society and the implementing agencies and the other actors that can help, help us find solution for, for, for the gender-based violence. But one of the major issues that is difficult also to do something about is the, is the, is the dominance of the informal sector, in, especially in the whole of Africa, not only in South Africa. The, 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 the informal justice system is still very strong and they keep women under the societal norms that are not quite helpful in reducing uh, gender, gender violence, especially, for example, we look to women in a certain uh, picture in, in this male-dominated uh, culture that we are, we are having. So those are issues that we as civic society need to look at, and especially for me as the chairman of the African Diaspora Forum, whatever aspect of, of uh, gender-based violence that we look at, my sisters and daughters in the migrant community are getting the brunt of it, getting the brunt of it. So we feel that uh, to close about answering your question, I'm saying that 
inability to implement the policies that are very good leads to some sort of impunity that many of the forces that are supposed to be implementing gender violence prevention are sometimes the perpetrators and this reduces women's ability to report it and also uses that some of those things will be looked into in detail especially long-term programming instead of short-term programming for the doctor algoni uh, can i can i cut you right there uh, we, we are having a difficulty to hear you i believe that you need a better for your internet can we pass uh, to uh, our next panelist but i'll give you more minutes uh, when we have the second round so please try to a better uh, location where you can okay. have better reception for the internet okay thank you but uh, for uh, for your uh, comments for now uh, i would like to come to uh, rehana khan parker uh, she is the founder of uh, voza uh, women or women in law and she's also the director of Rehana, uh, Rehana Khan Parker and Associates. Um, Thank you so much. Yes, I know that you are a strong woman, first of all, that uh, as far as I know you, uh, who is active in law uh, and human rights. What are your thoughts on this issue? What else we should be doing to stop this gender-based violence? Violence. How should we also support our uh, women uh, and make them even stronger? Thank you so much, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and good afternoon to all. First of all, I would like to say Happy Women's Day to everyone listening in, especially uh, the the councillors, the NGOs, the night shelters, and those women who, in fact, provide clothing when. Uh, a woman has to flee from her home with absolutely nothing. My women's day dedicated uh, the cause for, for victims against um, gender-based violence. I come from the position of GBV, gender-based violence, thrives in a climate of silence. That was the words, in fact, of President Ramaphosa in June when he said, by looking the other way, we become complicit. And, and that is a huge challenge in South Africa, across communities, as the, the impact of a generational culture of violence has become the norm and, the, and it's become accepted. And if we do not break that generational culture of violence, we are going to be sitting with a, an even bigger problem in the future. And I say so because you quoted the figures and Fatima is 100% correct. Statistics do not tell you the, the correct story, but what we do know is that approximately 51% of women have experienced um, violence at the hands of someone with whom they are in a relationship with. And we've seen the murders, we've seen it, it's, it's all out there. However, how do we then, as a civil society, combat that? And, and the question has been put uh, by the previous speaker immediately before me that it is the government's responsibility to take part of that responsibility. It is accepted, and Mr. Ramaphosa admitted it, that the government on its own is not able to tackle this huge problem that has been coming for a long time. We accept that it's been there before the lockdown. Of course, the lockdown has exacerbated it. And therefore, again, the figures that come to the fore of 120,000 calls being made to the Gender-Based Violence Command Center within the first three weeks of the lockdown, can you imagine what that figure is today? Given that women are now entrapped in, in homes under lockdown, um, as at the end of the first quarter, the unemployed figure the unemployment rate was 30.1%. That's the figure 
um, as at the end of March 2020. With the lockdown, that figure should have already been released. So we're sitting with a massive unemployment. It's no longer at 30.1. I would like to believe it's double that. Um, women now saddled and strapped and entrapped in a household that's abusive is stuck there because of the financial situation. Now, what are the solutions? How do we take this challenge, which is multi-layered, came across time, not particular to South Africa alone. It's a problem worldwide. How do we, as a South African society, do something about it? Now, there are two ways, and I was hoping that we were not going to have a lockdown because I was hoping that we were going to use that lovely refugee concert that we had last year which was out through your, you were part of that concert. Because we need to get our nation behind the slogan of GBV. I don't think there's been a voice that has come through strongly enough to say, let's fight the scourge on a, un on, on a united front as a nation. And there are two vehicles that I believe that can do that, but we can't do it at the moment. And that is through music. That is one medium where, where you can have a concert that influences people uh, to, to get behind the message. And the other one is sport. Sport has an ability to, to draw crowds beyond measure. But seeing that we're not able to do that, what is there then that we can do? There is a lot that we can do. How do we strengthen the existing structures that are there, the very people that I had mentioned, the NGOs, the activists, the advice desks, the lawyers, the counselors, and I'm talking about uh, trauma counseling, social services. How do we bring them all together so that we can work as a united front holistically and throughout South Africa? So I'd like to use the Waza Women in Law and Leadership example. When we founded Waza, it was done on exactly the same basis, although gender-based violence was not the issue. The issue was about briefing patterns, about women and diversity, unconscious bias and those issues, and gender parity. We realized that we had women sitting in the, in the furthest corners of South Africa, and we needed to tease them out so that we could get a national sisterhood of women in law to champion that particular cause. That was successful and we've reached that. We've now stepped our game up somewhat and we realize that we have a role to play as lawyers other than championing the cause for gender parity. Gender-based violence and gender parity in fact goes hand in hand. So when I'm talking about unconscious Bias, um, the gender pay gap, and all of that, all of that, are, it, it's not factors in isolation. So Warsaw Women in Law and Leadership is now seeking to step up and, and reach out and build bridges with other organizations throughout the country. We are at present speaking to various different organizations that has a national and, um, for the gentleman that's on the panel, an international and an African perspectives as well. We, we, we are, we've partnered with women in law in Vienna, Pakistan, the Institute of African Women in Law, and we've also done the recent um, search, we will be, not a survey, a report in fact, which will be re, um, sort of re released pretty soon called the Women in Law Report, where more than 8,000 women in law have been part of the survey internationally. So what we want to do to overcome the culture of violence is to have a multi-stakeholder approach with the various arms of government, um, not just the Department of Justice. We're talking about home affairs. We're talking about social services, sports ministers. And of course, the South African police services on its own needs to be sensitized as to how to deal with victims and so forth. Let's not forget our criminal justice system. Mr. Ramola has admitted that we need to do something and we cannot do it alone. And of course, coming from the law, um, from the law sector, the judiciary and the magistracy will need to be sensitized. There's going to be a serious effort needed to be, to be um, undertaken by our magistracy and our judiciary in 
in fact, creating awareness and education programs for You will hear that if a census party is total uproar, that how could which are shocking. So apart from those stakeholders, it would be the, 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 the shelters, the NGOs, and let's not forget our faith leaders, um, because they also play a pivotal role in being able to reach out to people. And of course, we need the private sector, because you need funding to do this. And that is the only way I believe that we are going to be able to build a bridge between the private and the public sector and you have to do it through a, a multi-prong. So I'm inviting organizations who would want to be part of an umbrella body so that we can, in fact, lobby for change in Parliament through these various um, um, uh, avenues. But just for women in law to, uh, in isolation, uh, to cha champion a change is not going to be sufficient. We would like to strengthen existing structures through the, those bridges which we in fact would like to see happening. I think I've said enough um, for now. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So uh, everybody you heard, uh, Rehana Khan Parker, uh, organizations, individuals, women. So uh, here is a starting point, one of the starting points uh, that uh, she's offering. Uh, but uh, uh, Rehana, I would like to ask you to also, uh, for the second round, that uh, please uh, have a better location. Uh, you were better than Dr. Algoni, but you still had some challenges. Please have a, uh, you can uh, shut down your camera now and then uh, change your location if possible. And I would like to come to right now, uh, Ms. Ilagandi. I, in fact, had, um, on purpose, uh, wanted her to, to uh, speak last um, because we've heard uh, the facts, we've heard the problem, we've heard, we've had some suggestions in terms of the uh, 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 solution of the problem, but I would like to go a little deep uh, and uh, uh, try to understand the, um, uh, the spiritual side of it. Uh, you are a world-known peace activist. Uh, you also uh, work to uh, apply and spread the message of Mahatma Gandhi and his philosophy of non-violence. Uh, what makes us commit these violence against women? What should we do to educate masses uh, on the inclusiveness of human rights? And how should we become a better human being rather than sometimes monsters? So what do you think? What should we do? Okay. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer. I don't have the answer to that, but I can try. I can try to tell you what are some of the things that I believe that we can do? So firstly, I want to say that, uh, you know, we sort of tend to look at laws and we look at government, but we don't look at understanding, you know, um, educating ourselves about things and uh, taking responsibility ourselves. So I'm going to approach this from that point of view. So firstly, I want to say that when we look at this COVID-19 situation, because it's a very good parallel to look at. So when we look at it, we see that there are those countries where they imposed a law and everybody obeys. They obey because they are afraid of the government, because the government is very strong, authoritarian government. So if you don't obey, you are going to experience a lot of punishment. That is why they obey. Then there are those governments where 
there is absolute laxity. There is no uh, kind of, uh, you know, strong um, approach to it. So in some of those situations, what you find is people don't take it seriously. They listen to the government, but they have their own ideas. And they listen to their own ideas. That is, you know, that uh, this virus was brought by somebody else. It's not going to affect me. It only affects a certain group of people. All those kinds of myths. And because we have those myths in our minds, we are not serious about observing the regulations that we should be observing. And then you have another government. And I will say, for instance, in Kerala, you know, where the people are, there's 100% literacy in that country. They started educating the people right from the beginning. As soon as they heard about this outbreak, they told everybody understood exactly what this is. And because they understood, you didn't need to have a law. You didn't need to have police to uh, get people to observe those, uh, you know, the, the conditions, comply with all the conditions. And so the result was that you have a community that is looking after itself. Now, that is the kind of ideal situation that we should work. So coming to gender-based violence, if people understand what this is about and are able to control within their communities, if we have strong community, then you wouldn't have the incidence of gender-based violence as it is at present. You know, uh, there'll be a much more uh, curbing through social control, not through laws or anything, but just social control. So that's my first point, that people need to be educated. They need to learn. They need to learn why nonviolence, for instance, can create a better society. And that violence, you know, at the moment, violence is fashionable. That is the way life is. That is how we understand that if you are not violent, then you are not a man, for instance, or you're not powerful. Your power is only in violence. And violence is the speech. It's, uh, you know, everything. Uh, you explain the different forms of violence at the beginning. And so all that revolves around the way you behave. And the way you behave is through the understanding of society. Uh, you know, where uh, people um, value uh, a person who is strong and who is mature, you know, uh, and, um, and can be violent. And if we say that that is the image that we want to create, then that is the kind of society we get, which is what we are experiencing at the moment. My third point is that you talked about spirituality. If we look at all our scriptures, Fatima spoke about Salam Alaikum, what does it mean? And yes, it means that. But how many people, when they read the entire scripture, believe that the scripture tells them to be nonviolent? How many people believe that? And this is across the board. I'm not talking about just the Islamic scripture. It's every scripture, every Hindu scripture, even the Buddhists who are supposed to be the uh, most gentle and most nonviolent people, even their scriptures have been interpreted in a way that violence is acceptable. 
So you see violence in Buddhist countries, uh, predominantly Buddhist countries, and spread by people who are actually very highly religiously, uh, you know, um, identified. And so what I'm saying is that how do we interpret our scriptures? And you will see also that in most religions, it is only the men who are at the helm of religious organizations. Why is it? Is it written in our scriptures? And when we looked at it, when the women in religion looked at it, we found that it is an interpretation that is given by men. If women were to look at the same scriptures and begin to pick out all the sections in the same scriptures which talk about the importance of women, which talk about the importance of us being two sides of the same coin, but we are side by side, men and women, yang and yang that Fatima was talking about, we are partners. When you begin to look at it in that way, then you are not going to have only male leaders. You will also have at the end women as well, because it's important for a woman to be seen here at the head of a religion so that she can also, uh, you know, impart religious education. So that's uh, how I look at the scripture. It's a work in progress. I hope that we are going to get there. I belong to an interfaith organization, which is international. And one of the things that we have, uh, you know, uh, set out as a target for our work this year is to look at theology and begin to reinterpret every religion and look at how we can bring the gender uh, issues within our religious uh, teachings so that we can begin to look at all these issues in a different way. And just my final point is that you talked about culture at the beginning. And I think that culture, religion, all these things are very interwoven, but we must also look at culture as not being static. All these things are evolving. Even our religious beliefs, even though we have the scriptures which are ancient, but our religious beliefs are evolving. And as you see new ways of interpreting the religion, you find that there are different uh, strands that are appearing. And so we can evolve. We can evolve either on the right or we can go to the left. And so it's in our hands right now. It is you, the young people who are going to, uh, you know, look at these things and going to experience the future. So right now is the time when you begin to re look at all these things. And as I'm saying, you can either go one way or another. So that when you're looking at it, you become so right wing, so conservative, that you begin to put women back again, uh, you know, a century ago. And that's not going to be good for the future. So if you look at it in a progressive way, you can build on the positive. So what I'm saying is I'm at the other end of the stick, even though Fatima can say that I look the same. <laughs> but my term is ending and I'm not going to see the change. I hope I will see it in my lifetime, but you are going to experience it. And so I am saying that please begin to reinterpret and find the right uh, solutions to these problems. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I really appreciate for your 
uh, comments. I just would like to say that we are here as Universal Rights Association that trying to follow up your footsteps. And I can easily see that right here that sparkling uh, uh, Rehana Khan Parker uh, and Fatima Chan and millions that uh, they are all ready to take the flag uh, and uh, carry on uh, forward. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for your uh, comments and your points that that was in fact that I was ex expecting from you that are definitely satisfied uh, that the points that you make that these are the things that we really, really need to uh, uh, take care of. Uh, I must say right here that we are receiving lots of comments on our Facebook page. And I'd like to remind once again that you can ask your questions and make your comments on here on um, Zoom chat uh, that you can write to us or rather on our Facebook page. Please do uh, ask your questions and write your comments. So uh, we finished the first round and then I just would like to ask our panelists uh, to, uh, to make their final comments that they've heard the other panelists uh, and then if they want to comment on uh, uh, or if they would like to add uh, more. So again, then I will come back to uh, Ms. Fatima Chuan. Uh, can we please have your uh, closing remarks, ma'am? Then we will go to the questions if we have and the uh, comments. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much. And I must say it's an honor and privilege to, to listen to, to all of the panelists. Um, I want to uh, uh, just uh, say that uh, one of the things that Ila has pointed to, which is um, women in religion and uh, looking at the scriptures uh, from a gendered perspective, I think is, is a, a phenomenal uh, thing. I think that... Uh, uh, this is something that has, uh, has, has not really been the focus uh, in many communities and in many religions. And I think it's about time that we all uh, embrace that. I mean, I have no idea uh, what happens uh, in uh, churches and mosques and temples at this time of the year, but it'd be very interesting to have... Um, uh, a, a woman in uh, in religious uh, theology uh, session at some point uh, to to put into perspective, I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, the kind of misogyny that happens uh, in the I would say interpretation rather than the actual scriptures. Um, the 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 other thing that I want to to agree with is that I do think that. Very often we look to government uh, to find solutions. Actually, we're talking about uh, uh, government and civil society really speaking to the consequences of gender violence. There's never going to be a situation where government can issue a decree and then everybody, uh, you know, gender violence will just stop. Um, it's about change within ourselves, each of us taking responsibility as part of society and as part of a nation that we hope to be building. Um, one of the things that, of course, uh, government has a role to play. And I would be the last to say that uh, we have perfect systems in place. And I think particularly when it comes to the criminal justice system, when it comes to things like uh, maintenance courts and so on, those things can be hugely improved. Uh, but again, we're talking about the, the consequences of gender violence rather than the cause and the source of gender violence. And that's where I think we need to start focusing a lot more. One of the things that occurs to me about, and, and I go back to my, to my issue that as, as mothers, particularly, and as women, we, we have a role to play. We have a very big role to play in framing how our sons particularly uh, see gender relations. And I wonder, you know, um, when, I watch, when I watch television, 
uh, I often see a common theme. And that, uh, and it's not just television, it's in, in, the, in the media generally, whether it's uh, marketing, uh, advertisements, etc. cetera. Uh, there's a growing acceptance in our society of commodification of women. Uh, we don't even think about, we don't talk about it anymore because it's just there and it seems acceptable. Whether we're talking about Hollywood movies, whether we're talking about uh, uh, advertisements, whether we're talking about pictures, whether we're talking about fashion magazines, etc. I wonder how a young mother having sons uh, would be able to, to, to change the, the onslaught that uh, young men particularly uh, uh, are faced with when it comes to the commodification of women. Prostitution, or we call it sex work, uh, sex work in, in South Africa, because we seem to be having the sense that it's, we must become more tolerant of it because we're talking about victimization, et cetera. But these are all, these are all things that teach young people particularly that women are commodities to own. And I wonder how we navigate as women this tendency in society. I don't think that, and I think Eastern philosophies and I think African philosophies particularly have a different uh, uh, impression or certainly uh, ha have a different take on, on the female sex. If you look at traditional African society, you very often have uh, leaders who are women. Uh, in, in Eastern philosophy as well, particularly in Hinduism, for example, there's a great reverence for the female gender as the, the giver of life. Um, and, and that is not the case in, in the kind of culture that seems to be overtaking the world uh, at the moment, which is essentially Western. And so these kinds of things, I think, need to be spoken about a lot more in small discussions, in larger discussions, uh, but that we need to become aware of the impact of the commodification of women in our society is, is very, very important, I think. Thank you so much, Wayne. Uh, thanks for your closing remarks um, that you also made uh, very important points. Uh, thanks a lot. I'd like to come to Dr. Elgoni uh, for his closing remarks. Dr. Elgoni. Okay, Dr. Elgoni, can you hear me? Uh, you are muted, Dr. Elgoni. Uh, please unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, I, I, I am really privileged to hear today those discussions because for me as a doctor and a public health specialist, whenever I look at a problem, we look at it in a four-step approach that mainly includes uh, the, the, the defining the problem itself and then identifying the cause and the other risk factors with this. And then when we look at the gender-based violence, there are a number of studies that say that it is not only about death and injury to women. The exposure of, to violence itself increases the risk of smoking, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, mental illnesses, and even some people who have minor diseases like heart heart and diabetes, they become exacerbated if there is gender-based violence. And all those things we needed to, when we identify them, we need to put a sort of, of an action and an intervention. And then if that intervention works, then we increase the, the action on it. And in that one, we usually talk about two things, which is the, the response and the, 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 <clears throat> the response and the, the actions that we do for that. For us, for example, there is a, 
activities that must be done from schools, even parenting exercises that when we, before you come to marriage, we, you need to identify the roles and responsibilities in, in a marriage situation. We need to look at the gender empowerment itself, giving women more roles, give them self-defense in rape preventing things. Then things like uh, group education and community action and outreach. We need to do more of them as part of the solution. We need to do the workshop programs, especially to the, to the security actors so that they know the rights of women and they, 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 they see it as a community problem, not a personal problem, because so many people are see, see those gender-based violence as if it is a personal problem of, of, of women. And then the most important one of it all is giving, empowering women, not only empowering them economically, but empowering them in the public sector uh, domain, empowering them in, 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 in especially in rural areas. We wanted them to have more, more power than, than men, or at least equal power, so that that dominance of men in, in pushing things down the system can, uh, can stop. And of course, as I, as I mentioned earlier, for me, as, 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 as working with migrants, all those things that we have been discussing today, migrants get, get more of it. We needed more understanding. How can we push the xenophobia of the system? Because the majority of those migrants who are uh, at the face of xenophobia, are actually uh, 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 women. Then to close, I wanted to say that we need to work at, at, at two levels. We need to le work at the personal level where we give to women that are abused shelter and rights and, uh, and uh, uh, personal attention and resources so that they reduce they reduce the impact of the of the of the violence against them but at least at the same time we needed to do the, the big community programs and we work at the at, at both both levels at the same time to reduce it i agree with honorable fatima that yes we are not expecting government to give us all the solutions but at least the government has very good policies. If, if it gave resources for those policies to be implemented, it will solve almost 70% of the, of the main root causes of gender-based uh, uh, violence. And then the rest, the, 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 the civic organizations can work on it and bring people to the level of understanding and respect to, women, uh, to women's uh, rights. Thank you so much, Dr. Ergoni. Uh, you really gave practical uh, suggestions. Thanks a lot. And uh, your uh, connection was way better right now. Um, uh, and I would like to come to uh, Rehana Parker uh, for her uh, closing remarks. Rehana. Thank you so much. Um, absolutely. Education cuts across all sectors from primary school from the home from the mother and the father being the homemakers in the home to the schools to every aspect of society that we connect with needs to be educated on the awareness of gender-based violence and sexual discrimination and gender that is an imperative and that is why it's not just from the judiciary or from the Minister of Justice um, and us lobbying for change in legislation, it is as well at school level. And, and it should be a dedicated life skills program at schools so that in those homes where women do not have the skills to be able to deal with the issues of um, parity, um, children and learners would in fact be getting that uh, supplemented at school. However, there is one aspect um, which I also need to bring to the attention of those listening in, and that is the use of language. Um, we need to ensure that our language that we use, in fact, 
has undergone a has to undergo a change and it's very simple thing it's it's the typical um you know women on boards would be assigned the secretary's job and not the chairperson's job it's also how you refer to the chairman and not the chairperson um the typical mistake and you hear it on the news all the time is that they refer to the legal fraternity when in fact it's the legal sector because fraternity in latin in, implies that it's just males so it's the use of language which plays a very pivotal role as well and i think that is something that we also need to work on it how do we change the way we speak because the way we speak and the words we use influence the influences the outcome the typical one is female i mean that's a hated word don't call anyone a female today call them a woman call them a male um and then lastly and then lastly what i have noticed over this entire weekend was the amount of males that were in fact championing the change for the issues that we are talking about very few i can count them on my fingertips look at all the women's programs that they've had it's run mostly by women most of the speakers were women and i have no problem with that at all but where are our males as fatima has said it's a yin and yin and a yang so where are our males in this entire discussion i would like to make that role report available to everyone that's listening in because it talks to the male champion of change women are tired of talking we have this discussion all the time but men are not hearing this they not part of this discussion so i say thank you to ura um for ensuring that the panel is diverse um, that is important and that the questions just didn't come from females um and they i'm using deliberately the word female from women we want the men in the main to hear this so that the men can also become actors in the home and not just leave it to the women to be doing that job from me i think i've said enough thank you so much thank you so much uh, anna for your closing rem uh, remarks that i would like to say in fact that i was going to say but you, uh, uh, i said uh, never mind but you mentioned now that i will say uh, when we first put this program on our facebook page uh, you can see that who is responding to uh, to the event and there we more or less uh, in fact that the event went to more than 10000 people that has seen uh, the event uh, i was checking it was only 20% of mm -hmm. uh, 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 the people that responded to the event was unfortunately men 80% uh, were all uh, women so it also proves that how in fact that right you are on your on your point but thank you so much uh i lastly would like to come to uh madam ila gandhi okay. uh, uh to ask for her closing remarks and we have lots of lots of comments that i will uh, read some of them uh, and then uh, maybe we can respond to one of the questions we have few questions that i will ask uh, to one of the panelists most probably to to rehana but uh, right now that we are here um, to listen uh, ms ila gandhi for her uh, closing remarks ma'am thank you so much um i need to touch on three things firstly poverty secondly protection and thirdly patriarchy so on poverty i have seen myself that you know many women who are abused are forced to remain in that abusive relationship simply because they are dependent they have a dependent uh, you know a sort of relationship and they are afraid of moving out because they uh you know don't know what to, uh where they will get the next meal from and so on so many women are forced to be in those relationships because of poverty and for as long as we have an unequal society we will continue to have unequal relationships because with an equal society your relationships also change so that's one thing that i think it can be discussed further but it's a point that i want to raise 
The second point I want to raise is that we often talk about schools, we talk about police station. These are all the places, your home, these are all the places that should give protection. When you are in the home, you are, you know, you expect to be protected in the home. You expect to be protected by the police. You expect to be protected in the school. And yet these are three places where a lot of the abuse takes place. So the rights, the human rights of the child, the human rights of the girl child is being violated daily because they are not protected by any of these institutions that are supposed to protect them. And therefore, we need to look at those institutions and see how we can make those institutions more uh, sensitive and able to protect the girls. And my third point is about patriarchy, because patriarchy is a way of thinking. It's not just about, uh, you know, having uh, a man, male headed household or, you know, that kind of thing. It's much more than that. It's a whole philosophy. It's a whole way of looking at life. And uh, this whole way of looking at life is not just by males, but it's also by females. So patriarchy is being promoted by both, um, you know, male and female. And uh, for as long as we continue to promote patriarchy, that whole question of commodifying, uh, you know, gender of commodifying women will continue because if you, um, you know, look at a male figure as being the powerful figure and the female figure as being the dependent one, then as a dependent person, you possess that person and you, you can do whatever you like. That's how society thinks. And that is the thinking that we need to change. So we need to address those three things that I talked about. Poverty, how we bring about a more equal society, how we can create protective institutions, basic institutions like the home, like the school, like the police station, and many other hospitals, all those things should be protective institutions. And the third is patriarchy. There's a lot more to discuss. I leave it to you to discuss it and work on that in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben, uh, for your uh, very important uh, comments. Uh, I would like to just quickly read uh, some of the comments uh, on our Facebook page. There are a lot of comments, but I'll try to uh, just have a look at. Please forgive me if I'm not able to uh, pronounce your name uh, correctly. Uh, uh, but Ria Ocus Van Nykerk uh, said, so many people need to be educated about uh, gender-based violence and it all starts on your home, then your street. Hilengive uh, Mbutuma said, this generation is fighting battles layered by the previous, we are on survival mode on most levels, but we need to make sure that the future generation doesn't have the same tears on Women's Day is as a result of women who choose to fight what will true future generations think us all. Uh, and Andrew uh, Jinna says, the constitution of South Africa does not distinguish between women and men rights. It's about human rights. Uh, Judge L.B. Sachs started its human rights to, street, uh, to stress that we are all equal 
Um, I'm just um, quickly checking. We have we have quite a quite a number of uh, comments and questions. Wow, it's it's even going on and on. But thank you so much. That unfortunately uh, we passed an hour. Uh, and then we can't read uh, all the comments, but your comments will definitely be there. And then whoever uh, checks for the program on our Facebook page will see and read your comments. That we have just one question I would like to ask, maybe to uh, Rehana may respond to this, or maybe uh, 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 Madam Chohan can uh, answer to this. But uh, I'd like to start from Rehana. Um, I can't see the name, but it says uh, just just a, a telephone's brand. Um, but I'll say that how do you meditate with an abusive family member without breaking family ties, especially when you are uh, in your own family when standing up for yourself? Um, so can you please respond to this, Rehana? Uh, maybe then later on. Uh, uh, Ms. John, that I'll uh, ask you. Very difficult. I mean, that's a, it, it, it is difficult to meditate in an abusive relationship and in a home that is just not conducive to the woman finding space for herself. But she can, there's various, I'm not sure what is her level of spirituality is, but there are various forms of spirituality, there's yoga, there's meditation, there's an art form, there's painting, um, crocheting, knitting, talking to people, being part of an NGO and doing what we are doing to get her out of that horrible mindset that she's in on the home front. So if she's looking to, to feel calm in where she is, she needs to be part of a sisterhood. Um, find organizations, find people that she will be able to talk to and give expression to herself. Um, very difficult, but it is difficult. But I think that's uh, all that I could ask, answer. I'm not sure whether Ms. Gandhi or Ms. Chan would like to add to it. Um, uh, Ms. Chan, uh, do you have anything to say for this question? Uh, well, well, firstly, let me just say I'm not a psychologist and I I can only speak from um, essentially personal experience. Um, the one thing I've learned is that there is no controlling other people. You can't control how others react to you. The only thing that is in your power to control is how you react. And once you really internalize that, you really then, I think, begin to find your power. Uh, and what always, what always helps uh, is having good friends, having uh, family members who are willing to listen, support you, um, and are a respite. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Algoni or uh, me, Madam uh, Ilagandi, if any of you would like to respond to this question, please unmute yourself uh, and you can right away uh, start talking. Thank you very much, actually, for me. I think the, 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 the family uh, relationship is, is a bilateral relationship. It is all of us own the family and own the problems that come into the family. And uh, talking it out and negotiations and uh, as uh, Honorable have mentioned now, uh, your way of reacting to things are very important. In the end, uh, always there are families who go apart because it is impossible uh, to continue. Those are some of the difficult solutions that people have come to. And you should not destroy your life because you are allowing a, an abusive uh, uh, partner in relationship. In the end, you try your best, you negotiate, you solve problems, you reduce your violent reactions. Don't, don't be uh, uh, reactive unnecessarily. But in the end, if all those solutions didn't work, there is no other way, uh, but it's, it's a difficult solution. 
Thank you so much, ma'am. Do you have anything to say? Okay, I um, I'm not quite sure whether the questioner is talking about meditating or mediating in that situation. But what I'm looking at is that at the present moment when people are under lockdown and many people are left in the home with the family in small confined places and nobody is going out, everyone is together 24 seven and sometimes people are getting on each other's nerves. Now the thing is, how do you find your space? And I think that that's where the family needs to, there's one thing that I have learned as a social worker and what I have been promoting with many families and that is the value of family meetings. We seldom look at getting the family together and having a formal meeting with the family where people can voice their views and you then set down certain rules. So those rules would give each member of the family a space, a time and a space to do what they want to do. So that once you have that meeting and you work that whole program out, you're not, you're not saying that only one person dominates, but everybody has their space. And so I think I just want to promote that idea of having a family meeting. And that, that can serve both as mediating in times of tension and it can serve the purpose of having a space in your whole day when you can have to yourself, this is my time, don't disturb me during this time. And I would like to do, I would like to meditate or whatever it is that you want to do. So through the meeting, you can negotiate for that space. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, sorry, we have lots of comments, but I just would like to read uh, also uh, from one of the, the Gary Young says, amazing panel, uh, hope we get to be part of more gender violence, violence talks uh, as they, there are no simple answers to gender-based uh, violence. Uh, so that's what we have as another comment, but we are, uh, kind of exceeded our time. Uh, I would like to round up and uh, close uh, the t today's discussion. Um, once again, that I would like to uh, thank to our uh, panelists for participating uh, to our panel uh, and for the important comments. And I also uh, thank to uh, our audience uh, on Facebook as well as on Zoom uh, for making time and for the for making comments and asking questions and for making time. Uh, we want all our audience and uh, viewers to understand that uh, woman is our mother, our sister, our wife, our daughter, our wife, our daughter, our uh, granddaughter, uh, in fact, our life as well, and our, our teacher, our doctor, uh, our lawyer, uh, and, and our judge uh, and our leader in some, some case. The respect and care we show to them is in fact that respect and care we show to ourselves. And I want to highlight once again uh, that human being is the most valuable creation in the universe. Each and every human being has a right to live in dignity. We all have to respect to that. So once again, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for the, I think it was an amazing uh, panel uh, and, and discussion with you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank to everybody. Uh, until next time, take care of yourself and take care of others. Thank you.